This video is sponsored by Only Crits. When the earliest documents for the 1D&D playtest started rolling out, they included a proposed rule that a natural 20 is always an automatic success, and a natural 1 is always an automatic failure. And half of the D&D community was outraged. Now, this is not an endorsement of the rules refresh of D&D, and I don't even really like talking about playtest rules on the channel because nothing is set in stone yet. Case in point, this rule for the nat 20 and the nat 1 didn't last very long. And in fairness, there were some issues with how this rule was presented in such a way that made it trivially easy for players to abuse. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But honestly, I didn't mind this idea. Because to me, it felt like Wizards of the Coast was simply picking a side in a debate that has plagued the 5e community for years, and I'm willing to bet people debated this in the older editions as well. And the side WotC chose happened to be the same one I land on. As far as I'm concerned, if a natural 20 doesn't mean the player can succeed, there's no reason to ask them to roll. And if rolling a 1 doesn't mean they fail, then there's no chance of failure, and no reason to roll. But of course, this ignited a whole debate in the D&D community, and having an opinion on 1s and 20s is only part of it. So let's cut to the heart of the matter. When do you call for rolls? This question can intimidate new dungeon masters and divide seasoned players. Every GM will find their own comfort level, and it might vary group by group depending on their players. So of course, I'm going to definitively answer this question over the course of a single YouTube video. Buckle up, I'm going to solve a decades-long debate in the TTRPG industry. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Right now, 69% of my viewers are not subscribed, and don't get me wrong, that's the funny number, but there's also a chance you aren't subscribed and didn't realize it. So make sure to hit the button, it really helps the channel grow, and it's totally free. One of my goals in my games is to cut down on unnecessary rolls as much as possible. In my opinion, there's no point in having the players roll for everything, when there are sometimes I don't need the dice to determine an answer. For example, if your character was raised alone in a monastery with no knowledge of the outside world, I don't need you to roll to determine whether you've heard of an obscure, long-dead ruler of a nation on the other side of the planet. Like, I already know that answer. You haven't heard of them. You don't need to roll. Likewise, if your character is a scholar about giants and you ask to roll for knowledge about the Ordning, I might just give you the info if I feel like it's reasonable for your character to have that information. Especially if I feel like it moves the story along, or you having the knowledge isn't just reasonable, but it's also more interesting than if you don't know the knowledge. But let's be really clear. You don't necessarily have to have a hard and fast rule for how to handle roles in your games. You can change your approach based on who your players are, what they prefer from the game, the story you're telling together, whether you're playing digitally or in person, people like rolling physical dice, and probably a whole myriad of other factors as well. But the goal of my channel is to give you the tools you need to make decisions and determine your style, so let's start by drilling down on what exactly dice rolls mean in the context of an RPG. Role-playing games use dice, well, okay, some games use playing cards or Jenga towers or whatever the mechanic is, but we use these tools to introduce an element of randomness, to make it so the story isn't fully in our control. Well, that might seem obvious, but there's a real benefit to the system. It means no one person not even the Game Master, is fully in control of what happens at the table. And considering how much power the Game Master has in just about every other way, relinquishing that power actually matters a lot, especially relinquishing it to something random. The dice answers the questions you can't answer yourself because we've determined it's not your role to do so. Now, we have some wiggle room there. Yeah, we can just declare, yes, you know this, no, you don't know that, we can only ask people with a certain skill proficiency to roll, or declare that just one person can roll, it's just whoever asked for it first. But at a certain point, we have to allow our players to roll some dice and generate some uncertain outcomes. Role-playing games use dice to resolve the way the world responds to the player's actions. Your player declares that they want to do something, and the dice determine whether the player succeeds or fails. Now, because I believe the dice represent the world outside of your players and not the competency of their characters, that plays a huge factor in my style of narration. I don't like to put the onus of failed roles on the player character's actions. Some GMs love to do this, and some players fall back on it as well. If someone rolls a low charisma check, those types of players and GMs will describe that something got caught in the character's throat or something, undermining their attempt to convince the town guard or whatever it is. But if you accept my premise that the roles simulate the variables of the game world and not the player character's skills, because we have a character sheet to reflect their skills, then it makes no sense to describe these failed roles as something the player, or their character, did wrong. If an attack misses, I don't find it useful to say that the player swung the sword poorly. That just makes the player feel like a failure when it's not necessary. Instead, I prefer to narrate that dice rolls simulate the reaction of outside forces. 
The panicked goblin can dodge an attack. The orc can knock the blade back with his shield while hissing curses. And the vampire lord can effortlessly shift his head to the side and laugh away the hero's efforts. Similarly, rolling low persuasion checks might mean someone is hard-headed or needs more convincing. Rolling low arcana checks might mean that this sort of research is outside of the PC's area of expertise. And rolling low athletics checks to climb a cliff might mean that the stone surface is slick, or the rocks break off beneath the hero's feet. A failed stealth roll doesn't mean you were absently humming or ripped a fart. It means someone happened to look up and see you. I was actually going to make a whole other video about this, but Eric from the Geek Pantheon beat me to it. He made a great video about representing failed roles without describing your player characters as fundamentally inept. He said everything I was going to say on the subject, so go check that video out. Uh, link is in the doobly-doo. But what if that chance of failure makes no sense? What if the risk of failure is so low that any attempts to explain a failure might seem ludicrous? Alternatively, some challenges might be so impossible that a high roll can't reasonably achieve anything. If your barbarian tries to bang down an iron door with her bare fists and you ask her to roll, you're saying that this task is possible if they roll high enough. But I have no problem sometimes saying that that's not true. Let's briefly use persuasion checks as an example. Sometimes I'd much rather play a scene out in dialogue rather than purely rolling dice. In those cases, when I do call for persuasion checks, I view them less as how persuasive is the player, but more as a way to determine whether the NPC is receptive to the PC's argument. Sometimes I don't want there to be a role at all, because I want the party to actually make their case. Social interactions are where I tend to reward advantage the most liberally, specifically when the party makes a really compelling argument, and I think the NPC would be swayed. But other times I remove the dice entirely, because I want the players to actually make a convincing argument. That's something I can usually get away with because my players love role-playing. We'll do a whole other video another time about whether it's reasonable to expect players to role-play charisma checks. Actually, here's a spoiler. It's not reasonable to expect that, but if players find fun in playing that way, there's no harm in rewarding them by removing the dice rolls if you think they can rise to the challenge and make a compelling argument. But even if you have a party full of role-players, you can still use the dice rolls not to determine whether their argument was compelling, but how easily an NPC's mind can be changed. I talked about this a lot in my video about Critical Role episode 26. That party is full of role players, and they were still expected to make multiple roles to convince the druid not to fight them. Now you can also abandon roles when there's no real consequence to failure, especially when it allows the players to do cool things. For example, some bard players like rolling performance checks whenever they play in a tavern, but one of my players who was playing a bard once pointed out that she had the entertainer background, which gives her free room and board when she performs. And whenever she came to a tavern and asked to perform, I had her make a performance role. But since that's a mechanic that always works automatically, it's one of her core character traits, she pointed out that the performance check roles were unnecessary. And more than that, she felt like these roles were denying her the opportunity to do one of the cool things she liked about her character. Making her role a performance check every time her character took the stage was less interesting than having the player narrate the performance and maybe come up with fake song names or whatever. And that's to say nothing of the fact that it was actively slowing down the game for everyone, especially since there was no tension. Nothing bad could happen if she rolled low, really, because she was already guaranteed room and board because of her background trait. It's also important to avoid roles that could potentially break the game. I'm not talking about games that break your story because I think that expression is dumb and misreads the purpose of a role-playing game, but I do think you should avoid allowing roles that would stop the story dead. Would a failed investigation check mean that a murderer got away and the story resolves unsatisfyingly? Well, maybe you just say that anybody trained in investigation is able to find the clue if everybody failed the role. But for me, one of the biggest considerations has nothing to do with the story. It's all about the characters' backstories. I want to honor the choices the players made when creating their characters. I want their decisions to matter. So when someone makes a character who knows a lot about a certain field, I'm more likely to give them advantage when that topic comes up, if I even ask for a role at all. On the other hand, if they're trying to figure something out about the most obscure piece of lore in my entire campaign setting, and their character is a 10-year-old illiterate urchin, I don't think it's super likely they've already picked up on that piece of critical information. So why should they roll? Well, honestly, you might still ask them to roll because there's a difference between impossible roles and improbable roles. For example, back in episode 28 of the Vox Machina campaign, Grog made a roll to identify a structure, even though he had a negative 2 modifier, and he got a natural 20. Now, the structure in question was a stone giant fortress, and Grog is a goliath, which is functionally a half-giant, so it's not 
out of the realm of possibility for Grog to recognize it. But also, you can make the case that Grog spent years wandering the wilderness. There's the same chance he'd recognize anything. Why couldn't he recognize a chimera's lair or the site of a failed dragon hunt? And by giving him a chance to make a role, it could lead to a lot of fun. And it can be a really interesting challenge for you as a game master to figure out how to explain the results of a successful role. But there's another factor to consider. What roles mean to players? If somebody has a chance to succeed or fail and the dice don't go their way, some might take it personally. Others might blame the dice and blame their low stats, and others might just let it roll off their back. But denying the results of a role effectively means you take their agency away. Sometimes that's fine. If you give someone information that they instinctively know, you're rewarding their character choices. However, rolling for knowledge gives the information value, but overusing roles can have an unintended consequence. If you make your players roll for rumors or mundane trivia, it will make the facts they learn seem important. You can sometimes use this to your advantage, but be wary about giving the party unnecessary information based on a role. They might either start to undervalue the info you give them, or start seeing shadows where there are none and start trying to run down false leads. What if a player wants to jump over a narrow gap in the battle map instead of using the bridge, and they're doing it purely as flavor or colorful description? Well, if you make them roll, you're taking away the choice they made to just add a fun little flourish. But if you want the gap to feel treacherous, you have to enforce the idea that jumping the gap is risky. And even if the act itself isn't dangerous, there needs to be some consequence to failure if you ask them to roll. I'm thinking about a moment in the second episode of Fantasy High when Lou Wilson's character tries to leap over a cafeteria table during battle, but trips and fails and falls prone. And I would at first say that this was a frivolous roll, except falling prone in the middle of battle does matter. Making sure your level one characters know they're not action movie heroes who can leap over objects does matter. And the positioning and movement and tactics of that campaign mattered a lot. So making that clear early on was really valuable. It also matters a lot whether you're playing in person or not. As I said earlier, players like rolling dice. I think denying someone a roll means a lot more in an in-person game than it does online, because clicking a button is so much less satisfying than rolling a clickety-clack math rock. And that's more true than ever if you and your players buy your dice from today's sponsor, Only Crits. Only Crits dice are really, really cool and so satisfying to roll. I'm genuinely serious when I say that one of the reasons I'm most excited to return to an in-person game as soon as I can is because I really want to show off some of my Only Crits dice. But in the meantime, I'll have to settle for encouraging you to pick up your own incredible dice sets. If you visit onlycrits.com slash supergeekmike and use the promo code supergeek at checkout, you'll help support this channel and you'll get some truly beautiful dice. Once again, that's onlycrits.com slash supergeekmike and use the promo code supergeek. Thanks so much to OnlyCrits for sponsoring this video. Now, something that sometimes really bugs me is when players make their own declarations about what they're rolling. This doesn't always bother me. I think the context depends a lot. For example, I'm going to make an investigation check to look for traps is reasonable because the character is looking for traps and the player knows what mechanic I'm going to use to resolve that request. If, especially if they've already looked for traps before in my games and they know what role I'm going to ask for. However, I'm going to roll a history check to see if I recognize that name tends to bother me more because how do they know what skill they should actually be rolling? I might instead be asking them for a religion check or an arcana check. And sometimes I truly don't care what the skill is. If they say, what can I roll to recognize that name? I might say, roll an arcana check or a history check or a religion check. Depending on what you roll, I will give you different information. But because I sometimes do that, that's just one of the many reasons I don't always love it when players make a declaration about what they're going to roll, because I need to make up my own mind first. I have my own opinions on these things. But honestly, it's even better if the player asks, do I recognize the name? Because sometimes I won't ask for a roll at all. I'll just say, nah. Now this is honestly the issue most people had with the rule from the 1 D&D playtest, where a natural 20 always succeeded and a natural 1 always failed. The rule was effectively presented in a way where players could resolve their own results. They could say, I'm going to roll a persuasion check to ask the king to adopt me and make me his heir, and then they'd roll and say, cool, yep, it succeeded, it happens. That's obviously not what the designers had in mind, but what was ultimately missing from that rule was this discussion, that you, as the dungeon master, need to be able to determine when your players do and don't roll. It's not their decision. Now, the funny thing is that sometimes, this is actually something you can solve when you're designing your adventures. For example, we talked earlier about how you don't want a single success to make things too easy and a single failure to grind the adventure to a halt. But over time, you can actually design your adventures to make this question irrelevant. If you can keep this question in mind as you run your games, over time, you'll start actually structuring your adventures so that a single success or a single failure 
can't lead to the adventure ending too soon or hitting a dead end. For example, you can make sure that the vital information the players need to proceed isn't completely locked behind a single role so that if they fail, the story can still proceed. You can make sure your adventure is structured so if the killer gets away during a murder mystery, that's not, you know, the end of the adventure sucks for you, you failed. You can even start designing your challenges so that if they take out the villain too easily, that's not the end of the challenge. That's not the end of the adventure or the threat they have to face. But again, in my opinion, this is the most important takeaway for this subject. Don't have your players roll the dice if one of the two possible outcomes is unacceptable or impossible. But of course, that's just my opinion, so I'm keen to hear what you think. Let me know in the comments below. Next month, I'm going to make a sequel to this video where we talk about how you can make up your mind before a roll, so keep your eyes open for that. If you like this video, subscribe and ring the bell to make sure you know about new videos as soon as they come out every Monday and Thursday. If you want to help the channel financially, sign up for my Patreon or check out one of my wish lists. If you want to hang out with other awesome members of the community, join my Discord server. If you want to catch my weekly live streams, follow me on Twitch. And if you want to stay up to date with my latest updates, sign up for my newsletter. All those links are in the doobly-doo below. A lot of what we discussed in this video circles the idea of metagaming and how much information players and characters have, so make sure to check out my recent video about metagaming, it's a good one. Until next time, play fair, and have fun.